Welcome everyone. My name is Stacy Hodge, producer of learning experiences at the National Restaurant Association show. And I would like to thank you all for participating in this webinar titled Five Social Media Trends That Will Take Over 2019 and How to Prepare, sponsored by Sochi. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few logistics for the webinar. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. You may type questions at any time using the questions window in your GoToWebinar screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible before we conclude. If your question is not addressed, we will follow up via email. And you will receive a brief evaluation after the webinar. We ask that you take just a few minutes to provide your feedback and suggestions on topics you would like us to consider as we develop future programs. And I'd like to thank Sochi for sponsoring this webinar. Their continued support of programs like these provide valuable information and resources to the industry, which is incredibly important to us all. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Monica Ho, Chief Marketing Officer at Sochi, which is the leading social media marketing and reputation management platform for multi-location businesses. Monica is one of the country's top mobile marketing experts and was named one of the Business Insider's Most Powerful Women in Mobile Marketing. She brings 20 years of experience working with brands like Walmart, Dunkin' Donuts, and Taco Bell on strategic marketing and branding initiatives. She has presented at top conferences, including the National Restaurant Association's Restaurant Revenue Growth Conference, Mobile Marketing Association's CMO Summit, and the Coca-Cola Data Summit. She is a former member of the executive board of the Mobile Marketing Association and former chief marketing officer at XAD, the leading global technology platform driving in-store visits and sales by leveraging location as the primary source of intent. Please join me in welcoming Monica. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining uh, the webinar today. I'm just going to switch over to my screen. Um, thank you so much for that great introduction, Stacy. Um, as Stacy had mentioned, I am currently the CMO of Sochi. For those unfamiliar with Sochi, we're a top social media management and reputation platform built for multi-location brands. Um, but outside of Sochi, I'm also a mother of two. Um, hopefully you can see my two gorgeous children to the left, or monsters sometimes. Um, when I'm not with the kids or uh, working at Sochi, I also enjoy um, doing some activities outside of uh, work. I am, uh, I practice jujitsu, so that is not me on the ground, that's me in a triangle lock. Um, and I also run, so I try to get out and do those things. Um, and as Stacey mentioned, I have over 20 years of digital data, tech, marketing, mobile, and social experience. So um, I try to bring a lot of um, knowledge um, and education to these webinars. I, I do uh, a lot of research, um, as well as uh, educating myself and, and keeping in tune with what's latest and greatest in the industry. So hopefully everybody, everyone will walk away with a little bit of something uh, from this webinar. Um, as mentioned by Stacy, we will have time at the end for questions. So please uh, put those in as you think of them as we go through the content. So we're here to talk about the five social media trends in 2019 and how to prepare. Um, before we jump right into those trends, I thought I would just start with a little bit of a primer as to why social is so big. Um, and this is no new news to probably a lot of you on the phone. 2.5 billion users, 8 out of 10 consumers leveraging social every day. Uh, we spend over two hours a day on our, in social media and on our mobile devices. So it's really in our face all day long and it's a powerful, powerful platform to reach your customers. When you think about social, though, a lot of people don't actually think of ratings and reviews as social. Um, and we, we see them as a big social component as well because they're a big part of user-generated content, or UGC. And we know social is big, but the usage um, of ratings and review uh, is even bigger. 91% of consumers read reviews. Um, almost 90% of them trust reviews as much as a personal recommendation. And now these ratings and reviews have become the number one factor consumers use in determining which business to visit, which is really important information to know, obviously, as a restaurateur or franchisee. Um, so social has become an integral part of the purchase process. Um, 
And when you think about social, it's affecting about 80% of consumers' business decisions in terms of their in, the, uh, the influence of that content. And I thought it was important to look at a little bit of data on the top social networks when you think about business engagement. A lot of times we think about social and we think about our own usage as a consumer. And that's great. I think, you know, there's a lot of networks I use personally. But when I'm looking for business information, I actually might turn to a little bit of a different network um, versus what might be my primary network for my own personal usage. So the chart that I'm showing here on the right is actually some information from our platform on where we're seeing the highest business engagement in terms of the top social networks. Um, Facebook is, is actually king here, um, primarily because they've invested a lot in local pages for businesses um, and also uh, trying to introduce business information in a lot of the different um, uh, uh, programs that they offer uh, as well. And we'll get into that as we get into the trends. In addition to that, when you think about where consumers are consuming ratings and reviews information, where, where is that happening? And again, as I mentioned before, we really look at ratings and reviews as a, as a big component of social. Um, and when you look at the top two sites, you kind of see why. Um, lots of activity happening on Google My Business, um, the local GMB pages, as well as Facebook. Um, and that's surprising for some people, especially when you consider the dominance of, of platforms like Yelp. Um, especially in restaurants, um, but this is this is really interesting information, and this is based on I should mention the volume of reviews that we're seeing in in all of these different platforms. And social has gone local, as I mentioned. Social uh, is you know with ratings and reviews and local content. What we're seeing is that when you look at social engagement with businesses. Most of that engagement is actually happening at the local page level. Almost three quarters of engagement with businesses is happening on local pages. And that's something really important I wanna stress with the audience here. Um, we work with a lot of brands that say, well, look, we've, we've tried to do you know, localized marketing on social and it's not working. And a lot of times when we see that, it's because we're, we're trying to do marketing via the national brand page. And it's fine to do marketing via your national brand page. I think it's great. There's certain content that does really well there. But if you're really trying to reach your local audience, you should be leveraging local pages. And again, if you're not, you're missing out on three quarters of the activity. And we brought up this, this uh, notion of local and the importance of it um, within social. And I, I wanted to bring up local again because it's actually at the core of some of the most recent uh, platform changes um, on some of these bigger platforms. So for instance, when you look at just Facebook, Facebook's been making some major shifts and in investments in local. Just recently this year, they've invested over 300 million to bring local news into their content feeds. Um, and the reason why they're doing that is because they know consumers are hungry for that localized information and they wanna bring more and more of that um, into their offerings. Just last year, they invested over a billion dollars in local tools and resources for businesses, including um, their recommendations uh, area, which used to be reviews. Um, they've added features that allow businesses to post jobs and a number of other features that we'll get into. And it's not just Facebook. Google is also making huge investments um, with really investing and double, down, uh, double downing on areas like Google My Business um, where they're adding additional features that are very social in nature. Again, we're going to get to a lot of these as we cover these top trends. So the top five trends that we're seeing for 2019 in social are reviews are reigning supreme, social care, and how just responding to social comments and reviews is so 2018. We really have to evolve our practice here. Response time is now nearing real time. A little bit scary when you think about that, but we'll cover how you can you know, actually manage that. Google, um, what's interesting here is that um, Google's interesting because if you're following uh, the world of social, you'll know that Google recently announced that they'll be deprecating their social platform, Google+. However, they're still very much in the social game, and we actually think they're the next big social network. Um, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. And then finally, um, our trends wouldn't be complete without addressing um, organic reach within social. And the fact that a lot of that organic reach has died 
but there's definitely ways to gain it back, and we'll cover some really great ways to do that. So that's uh, kind of the, the, the primer. Let's get into it. So trend number one, reviews reign supreme. So we mentioned in the beginning when we were kind of covering the stats that um, reviews are now the number one factor consumers use in determining which business to visit. Not only that, but it's now a number three ranking factor in how your business appears in local results. Um, and other platforms are starting to use this information more and more. So if you're not already aware of your local reviews, where they're appearing and managing them appropriately, please start doing those today. It's going to have the biggest impact on your business. When you think about reviews, what do we, what do we mean by managing? And what are some of the best practices? And how do you, how do you manage reviews well? Well, there's three, there's three um, I guess, tidbits I would, I would leave you with. Number one, you really want to manage your reviews to the rating sweet spot. Sometimes uh, brands or, or businesses think they have to have that perfect five-star review. And I will tell you, unless you're gaming the system, a five-star review is very hard to obtain and maintain, especially if you're a legitimate business and you have hundreds, if not thousands, of reviews. And the reason why that is is because in reality, you guys, we're never going to please everybody. In fact, consumers actually question businesses that have a perfect five-star review. What we found through research of our own as well as third-party research that we've, we've looked at is that the rating sweet spot is somewhere between 3.5 to four stars, meaning in order for you to be considered into a consumer's consideration set, you have to have at least 3.5 stars. If not, you're really turning that business away. Now, it's not just the overall ratings that matter. You also have to be concerned about your volume for a couple of reasons. One, some of these platforms won't even give you a rating unless you have the bare minimum, which is about 10 reviews. Um, but you want to build that base regardless because obviously you're going to not please everybody. So when you do have that unfortunate incident where somebody didn't have a good experience, if you have a good base of reviews, that one bad review or a couple of bad reviews won't tank your average rating. The other thing is um, the volume of, re of reviews is actually seen as a ranking factor. And I'll show you this when we get a little bit further into the content, but we're starting to see on places like the Google search engine result page that you might be looking at it and your business might be closer to a consumer, but you might be ranking below somebody that's above you, and you're thinking, well, why is that? I'm closer. If you look at their average rating and the volume of re reviews, and if they're beating you on those two things, that's the reason why they're, why they're coming above you. Uh, the reason why is because Google is basically saying, hey, look, more people have visited this place and they like it better. And we know in our research, consumers are willing to drive a couple of miles um, out of their way just to go to a place that they feel confident they're going to have a good experience at. And then third and foremost, respond to your reviews. Um, consumers are leaving feedback all the time and a lot of them expect you to respond. In fact, 80% of your consumers expect a response, especially to the critical reviews and feedback. And 40% expect a response within 24 hours. So those are just some, some best practices to keep in mind. Um, the other thing about responding is that we know it leads to ROI. Um, what we found in our research is that almost 90% of consumers stated that they would be willing to change a negative review if they felt that their situation was appropriately handled and they felt like that business really cared about the feedback. I will tell you guys, we just recently had this situation at Sochi. We're definitely not dealing with the amount of feedback that you all are probably seeing, but we had an unfortunate incident. Somebody was upset with us. They posted a really negative review about their experience with us. And we reached out personally, we apologized, um, we took that conversation offline, we figured out what happened, and we rectified it. And now that, that review is gone. We never asked that consumer to take it down, they took it down by themselves, which again, I, I can only speak from experience that that really worked. Um, and hopefully just offering some solace to some of you that, that might have some of those negative reviews still looming out there. So moving on to the, the second trend, social care, um, and how just responding is just so 2018. And why it's so 2018 is because reviews are now becoming so important, not just from a customer care standpoint, 
But again, based on your overall visibility, the, the brand presence and credibility of your business um, is really dependent on these reviews. So responding alone is just not enough. Um, you've got to do a couple of things. One, we talked about um, needing to always try to build that base of reviews, right? Um, the thing to be aware of, though, is you've got to be careful in how you build your base. Um, uh, positive, or sorry, uh, solicitation for positive reviews is under fire, and for good reason. A lot of platforms frown upon them, one in particular being Yelp. But you'll see that Facebook and Google have also taken the same stance. They do not support mass solicitation of reviews. Um, the reason why that is is because a lot of times businesses might reach out to consumers and say, hey, if you had a good experience, or you know, ask, did you have a good experience? And the consumer says yes, or they you know, hit your smiley face. And then if I do that, then you say, well, if you, you know, since you had a great experience, please uh, review us on these platforms. Obviously, a lot of these networks see that as kind of gaming the system because you're trying to um, increase your positive reviews over what might normally be a mix of maybe a little bit of both. Um, so there are definitely right and wrong ways to do this. Um, so if you are, you know, obviously a local restaurant, if you're promoting the fact that you um, do run on reviews, you have stickers on your windows about where you're rated, um, even POS signage, um, you know, stating that, you know, here are the platforms we're on, we'd love a review. Those are obviously really great ways to get reviews, again, um, and not by saying only if you had a positive experience. Um, in addition to that, um, you want to also uh, try to get, a, get in front of some of these reviews and be a little bit more proactive here. And that's really where we want to kind of take our strategy from 2018, where we were very much aware that we need to respond. We need to re re respond to these reviews quickly. But I think in 2019, just based on the importance of reviews, we need to get ahead of these, um, these customer service issues and be a little bit more proactive in resolving them. And in doing so, hopefully you reduce the amount of negative comments and reviews you receive overall, right? It makes that a lot more easy to manage. Now, if you're a single location, this is actually pretty easy. Um, there's a lot of really great tools within these platforms, like Google offers you a dashboard where you can get some insights. Facebook offers you the same, where you can start to look at your review information, start to look at keywords and themes, and, and try to proactively address those larger issues um, to try and, and hopefully um, circumvent some of these more negative reviews coming out. Um, if you're larger and you have multiple locations that you're trying to manage, obviously going through the native tools is really hard. And that, that it's hard to look at. It's hard to get insight out of those. There's some really great technology in the market today, um, Sochi being one, but there's a lot of other great social platforms out there that allow you to do things like what you're seeing on your screen um, what I'm showing you right now is just a, a quick snapshot of our sentiment analysis tool. And what we are able to do, um, our tool aggregates all of your reviews from anywhere you might be having a review, right? Whether it's Yelp or Google or Facebook, whatever. And it aggregates it into this word cloud. And you can quickly see visually um, where you are doing well. So those terms that are big and in green, that's what you're doing well at. The, the terms that are big and are, are in red, those are the ones that are, have a negative sentiment around them. And by using the word cloud, you can really drill in on what, what might be theming around that term and even drill down by market. Is it a trend by market? Is it a trend by location? Um, and really get into what might be driving these experiences so you can be a lot more efficient at rectifying the issues. All right, so response time, you know, trend number three, response time is nearing real time. Now this applies to reviews as well as just social comments, um, even in messaging. So two out of five consumers now expect a response to social comments, questions, and reviews within 24 hours. 14% expect a response immediately. That's crazy. I mean, it's not crazy, I guess, as a consumer. Um, with uh, you know, our use of mobile and the fact that we now have such quick access to information, this, I guess, shouldn't surprise most of us, that we, we want everything right now. And consumers uh, are no different. If they've had a negative experience or they have a question, you know, but for instance, do you deliver? They want, they want somebody to get back to them now. 
And the longer it takes you to respond to these folks, um, you probably either have lost business or have upset customers um, if they feel like they're not being serviced. So it's important to understand you know, what consumer expectations are and how to improve your response time. This is important not only, be, you know, again, from a customer care issue, but because a lot of these platforms like Facebook and Google are also taking notice to this. And I'll point out this, this example. So although it has not been yet listed as a ranking factor, you heard it from me first, this will become a ranking factor in the future um, in terms of your response time. Networks like Facebook, for instance, are starting to promote and enhance those businesses that are getting back to customers within 24 hours or within a few hours of a comment or a question being posted. In fact, Google is making a lot of investment in their messaging feature on local pages because they found that that is their quickest way to get a consumer from, um, what is it, from information to action, if you can get to that question really quickly. And so they're going to continue to promote that messaging feature because it, it really gives that consumer the satisfaction of, I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to get a response back. Um, when you go to local pages now that are doing a good job of this, that message box pops up and it tells you, like here for Home Flights, this business typically, typically responds within a few hours. So they're really trying to get those consumers to engage here. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, no one's saying that this is a ranking factor, but it will become one in the future. So be aware of it. Also, another interesting trend in the space is that Google um, is, is actually noticing that a lot of consumers have questions and they need responses to these questions. And they're doing things within their own tools that are getting responses to these questions, whether or not the business is participating. So for instance, I don't know if some of you have seen this or not, but um, I obviously, I'm, I'm a, I love to go out to restaurants with my family on Fridays. And recently I was at one of my favorite restaurants and after leaving the restaurant, I had gotten a pop-up on my, my device from Google Maps and it was asking me to answer a question um, that a consumer had left for the restaurant um, that hadn't been responded to. I thought that was fascinating. I'd never seen anything like that before, but I responded to it um, because I knew that this, this restaurant actually did play live music on Fridays and I responded to it. Um, but I thought that was interesting that a lot of these platforms are actually trying to get the businesses to participate and respond to questions. But if you are not going to take part, they're going to get these consumers' responses, whether that comes from you or somebody local in the community. And they're doing that in a lot of different ways. And we'll touch on that a little bit more in, the, in, in one of the uh, trends I have coming up. But before we get into that too deeply, I wanted to give you some um, sense of how you can better improve your response rates to um, consumers' questions, comments, and reviews. Um, so one, set up a clear notification system within your business. Make sure every channel where your consumers are leaving a review, they have somebody that's assigned to it and owns it so that you know if somebody doesn't respond to a review from Yelp, you know who is responsible for that. Um, set up alerts that are sent directly to your email or your mobile. So as soon as a question or review is posted, you're aware of it. Um, and you can get that, if you're a single location business, there's a great tool called Notify that you can set this up for free. Um, tools like Sochi also enable features like this. So again, you'll, you never miss a critical comment or question again, you're notified immediately. Um, the other benefit of, of using technology, um, let's say that I'm out, I'm, it's Friday night, I'm out with my family, I don't have time to respond. I could then, um, through a workflow tool, assign that question or comment to somebody else to respond to. Um, so somebody would be taking care of it immediately, right? Um, so setting up alerts is really important. Um, and not that you have to get on them right now, but just so you're aware of it and within a day, you get back to these. I think that's at least a good best, best practice. Um, and another best practice is develop SLAs around acceptable response time so that your teams are aware of what the expectation is. Um, so that they know that if somebody leaves a question or a comment on a particular network, you expect them to get back to them within 24 hours. Um, make sure that um, your, your teams are being efficient here. Um, I know for me, I, I have to turn off my work email and my alerts sometimes throughout the day. Otherwise, I, I have 
a problem, I, every time I see an alert, I'll go to that, and then I'm kind of thrown off from everything else I have to do. So, you know, how you can probably manage this effectively is have your team dedicate an hour a day where they go out, they check the alerts, they respond back to these comments and questions, depending on how many you have, but make that kind of a daily, um, a, a daily thing at a specific time. So it's not interrupting your day, but you are getting to these things in a timely manner. And again, be smart with both your tools and your time to ensure that no customer uh, question or comment is missed and you're really taking care of these uh, customer care issues appropriately. The other uh, best practice I would offer to you is um, plan for these uh, you know, common service questions or issues or uh, FAQs that might be coming up that you're seeing in your customer care centers or um, that you're hearing from your staff. Create a list of, of those common responses and provide this to your team. So if they're managing some of these platforms, they, they have a quick tool they can go to to copy and paste a response. Um, or, or they can create email templates or um, templates that they can quickly use for the different networks that make that a lot more efficient. And, and although these templated responses are, are quick, um, we should train the staff that if you're using a templated, templated response, we should try to make it as personalized as possible. So a really good best practice we try to, to utilize um, at our business is, you know, somebody's upset about something, it might be a common issue we've seen before. Um, I don't wanna just copy and paste that response into um, the, the platform. Instead, I might say, hey, Elizabeth, thank you so much for the feedback. Um, I understand this was your issue. So you're basically just reiterating the issue, use the person's name, and then copy and paste the response, right? Now you're being efficient, you're, you're personalizing the response, you feel good about it, the customer feels good about it, and you keep moving. The trend number four, Google becoming the next big social network. Again, I think some of you might be scratching your head here um, because of the recent news that they are deprecating Google+. But um, although they are going away with Google+, they have very much been working on and investing in Google My Business and their local pages. Um, and we'll go into details of, of what that looks like. But before we dive into this topic, we did want to do a quick poll of the audience. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy to, to, to run this. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Go, oh. go ahead. Yeah. No, sorry. Sorry, Monica. Uh, so you all should see a poll on your window, on your presentation window, and the question is, what is Google Q&A? So please take a quick second to read through and respond. Um, the options are a resource to get your questions answered by a GMB expert, a crowdsourced Q&A feature, a new forum that shows FAQs by business type. I have no idea. That is why I'm here, or none of the above. And we'll wait. This is a few more seconds for people to select their response. Votes are still coming in, which is great. Okay, it looks like we have about the majority. So we'll go ahead and close the poll and we'll share the results. Go ahead and with the and so it looks as though most selected a crowdsourced feature. Also, I have no idea. That's why I'm here. That's great. <laughs> Excellent. Are we back on my slide or do I need to take back ownership? You're back on your slide. Okay, excellent. So thank you guys so much for doing that. It helps give me a pulse of kind of where your understanding is. Um, knowing that, that uh, about 45% of you have no idea what this is, I'll, I'll, I'll take some time to explain it. But um, before we get into what Google Q&A is, Google has been building information about each one of your local businesses um, for many years. And they place this information plus additional features into uh, what they call the knowledge panel, which hopefully you can see here on my screen, which appears to the right of the SERP page or the search engine results page. Um, why that's important, you guys, is because there's a, there's a lot that goes on here. For instance, this is just another data tidbit. I, I, found the, I find this fascinating. So 
with all of these new features that Google has rolled out um, in their uh, Google My Business pages, now when consumers are conducting searches within uh, Google, and whether they're mobile or they're on desktop, if they have some sort of local intent, 60% um, of those local searches now result in zero click. And what does that mean? It means that What's happening now is Google is getting so good about serving information that somebody might need right on the search engine results page, whether it's here on the knowledge panel, or if I didn't look for a specific business and I did something generic like restaurants, they have the local uh, you know, three pack that comes down of the three local businesses they would recommend. Again, they're getting so good about serving up that local information that now over 60% of consumers no longer click to a website off of the search engine results page. Um, they actually stay within Google to find the information and transact. So that is a really important thing to understand, not only for why uh, these local pages are important, but in, in why it's so important to, be, to maintain the content that lives here. And I will stress, it doesn't mean that you no longer need a website. You absolutely need a website. But understand that your website is becoming more of a data, um, a data place for uh, platforms like Google versus a destination for your consumers. So that's definitely something you need to be aware of um, and manage to in, in the near future. So now let's get into Google Q&A. So for those of you that said it's a crowdsource feature, Congratulations, that's exactly what it is. Google actually launched Google Q&A at the end of 2018. Um, it wasn't a very publicized announcement. It was just a feature they added to these local business pages um, because they understood that consumers have questions and they want answers quickly. So what you'll see now is if you get to your local business page, either from the local search results or your knowledge panel, you'll now notice this little area right here that says questions and answers. On average, every business has at least one question now posted to Q&A. Uh, because this feature is growing in popularity, a lot of consumers are aware of them. Um, and, and whether or not you are aware of them or you're managing your page, it doesn't matter. These questions are there and they're building. Um, so you need to be aware of it. Um, and really, the Q&A feature is a place where any consumer can come in and ask a question and the answers come from either the business uh, owner, if, you are, if you've claimed your page and you're managing it, or it could, come, it could come from other people in the industry who are just answering for you. I wanted to show you this example of Home Slice Pizza. Um, this is a very popular destination here in Austin. Um, they have like 14 questions posted. And what I found so funny was that um, there's a lot of questions about why, and there's actually two locations that are side by side, and one location closes one day a week, and there was all this conversation in Q&A as to why that other location was closed. And some of those responses sounded pretty legit. Ignore the Ronald McDonald one, but the one about, you know, oh, the smaller one opens for lunch, and the other one's open for dinner, and they have a different menu. I thought that was legit. In fact, what, what ended up happening, if you see on the right here, the home slice pizza owner came back and responded um, to, to basically clear things up. It's like, hey guys, great question. We actually, they close one day a week in order to make desserts in that part of the restaurant. That's the reason. They don't have a different menu. None of that stuff was true. But it's interesting that you know the business owner had to come and clarify it. But if you were just to read what other folks were saying, you would be, you, you might think that was accurate. Um, you, what I have to stress here is that um, as a business owner, you have to look at Q&A and look at it almost like it's ratings and reviews um, because it is a UGC feature, user-generated content feature. Uh, it's gaining popularity. A lot of consumers are using it. Um, Google is actually promoting it, as I mentioned before. If they have open questions, they are using their different tools to try and get answers, uh, whether it's from your business or not. Um, the other thing that you need to be aware of is that 
you should be actively managing it because it could be that fake information or, or wrong information is getting out there and you need to come back and correct that misinformation. Other things like, you know, this guy, Ronald McDonald, well, they close it because it, it, the, that one is only closed for uh, Californians. I mean, that, that's kind of funny, but it's ridiculous. But, um, you know, by knowing that that stuff is out there, you could flag it and hopefully get that type of content removed. The other feature um, that I wanted to mention about Google and how they're really investing in um, these new features, and a lot of these features that I'm mentioning, by the way, are, are very socially oriented. Again, Q&A is much like ratings and reviews or comments. Another new feature that they've enabled is called Google Post. So think of, you know, adding a, you know, a post in Facebook. It, it works very much the same where they now have this feature where you as a local business um, can post whether it's a new announcement, offer, you've got a local event coming up, a product update. You can now post this on your, your Google My Business page. Um, it appears in your knowledge panel. It appears sometimes in local search results and map results. Um, so it's really interesting um, and something to be aware of. We've also found that this feature gets amazing action. We've seen brands increase their um, direct response tremendously just by using this feature. Um, and it's actually quite powerful. And we'll talk a little bit about what you can and cannot do with it in just a second here because I get into how to leverage them. So for Q&A, in order to actively take advantage of Q&A, you have to go in and claim and start managing your local Google My Business pages. Um, by having access and managing your page, you can then start to, to respond to Q&A and also the reviews that appear within your profile page. Um, and you'll be able to respond as a business owner, which is great. Um, the other thing that Google has started to do is send you alerts. If, you're, if you've managed your page, when a new Q&A is posted um, or review, you can now start to receive alerts to that, which is obviously very important. Um, the other thing you'll have the ability to do, we talked about creating um, frequently asked questions. Um, as a business owner, you would have the ability to go in here and pre-populate your Q&A section with frequently asked questions and appropriate answers um, so that you eliminate the fact of somebody asking the question about why you know, one of your, your business locations is closed and having somebody give misinformation. Um, finally, the next, the, the, the best benefit of claiming these pages and actively managing this section is you can flag inappropriate responses um, to um, some of the questions that are coming in there. Why is that important for you to do? Well, two reasons. Number one, um, if it is inappropriate and Google finds it inappropriate, it can be removed. Um, the other thing to understand is that Google has launched a, um, and you see it here on the bottom. You see how this one guy, the, the 45 guy, he's got a local guide designation underneath, underneath his name. What that is is Google has launched a program for consumers that um, respond to a lot of questions that are happening within Google or they're, they're reviewing a lot of businesses. They start to earn points. Um, and there's a whole program around this for consumers uh, to be involved in this program. And um, if they, again, and, and by doing that, they receive these, these local guide um, designations um, and, and they're able, they, they, they kind of increase their influence, if you will. Um, knowing that they have this program, um, and if you are seeing that these folks are giving misinformation or being inappropriate, and you flag them, even if Google doesn't remove the content, it does ding the local guide uh, reviewer, um, and they do get penalized for being flagged. So it's an important thing to, to do, um, to just make sure people are being, you know, using these tools appropriately um, and not, not giving this information. In terms of Google Post, um, now again, you, you have to have claimed your page in order to, to, um, man, in order to take advantage of Google Post. Um, and you can actually access this feature right in your dashboard, um, right here on the right, I'm showing you my dashboard, but it's right underneath the home page. Um, you can go in there, you can post up to 300 words, and you can include images, links, videos. Um, so it, there's lots of, of uh, ways to use this to drive business into your locations. Um, what I will tell you, two things to be aware of. One, um, 
they only they only really promote these posts for seven days, meaning that they'll appear, you know, pretty, uh, they have good visibility within your knowledge panel and can appear in search results and on your maps listing within seven days, um, after which you can still find it on your profile page, um, but they're just not, they're not going to promote it as much. The reason why that is is because Google wants um, the most recent information to be promoted here. In addition to that, um, they don't let you map post um, using Google Post. So if you have over 10 locations, you're not going to be able to use post to map post here. They really want it to be um, information that pertains to each one of your locations. So be aware of that. Um, uh, so knowing that this is a really incredible feature, um, it's, a, it's a social feature, uh, you're going to have to manage this much like you do social, right? You're going to want to think about um, developing a consistent posting schedule so you can really take advantage of this feature and know that they're really only getting promoted for seven days. The other thing I would recommend is that you track your performance of each one of these posts within your dashboard. Um, you can get you can really get some understanding about what's working, what's not. If you want to go deeper, you can use UTM parameters um, via your Google Analytics to even get deeper insight. Um, again, great tools within Google My Business. Um, if you're a local business that has one location, great. If you have a lot of locations, hundreds and thousands, you might want to look at technology like Sochi to help you manage this at scale. Um, oops. That was just an animation that I, I didn't get to, but okay, we're getting on to our uh, number five and final trend, which is the death of organic reach. So um, some may or may not have heard of what happened last year, but um, what had happened was um, for those of you that were really taking advantage of uh, the power and impact of social marketing, um, you knew that last year uh, Facebook made a pretty significant algorithm change where they changed their algorithm, um, and really the purpose of the algorithm change was they wanted to make sure that consumers' news feeds were populated more with things that I would want to engage with or that I would like as a consumer, and really reduce the more promotional business type of content getting into feeds. That was the intent of it. So what they started to do is they started to look at um, things that are being so uh, posted on social as um, posts that get high-valued engagements versus posts that get low-valued engagements. And let me explain that really quickly. So today, you can still get really incredible engagement and reach on your, your organic posts within sites like Facebook if those posts are receiving um, comments and they're being shared by your local community. Um, because Facebook looks at those type of engagements as being highly valued. The posts where you're just getting reactions, smiley face, sad face, likes, those are low-valued reactions. You get no credit for those. And they, they get very little reach, very little audience. And that one change made a significant impact to those of you that were leveraging social marketing. And why that was was because if you were in early, just by posting something like, hey, we're having a special today, come in, you know, uh, $3 apps for two hours, whatever. Um, that post would be seen not only by your local community, but their network and their network and their network, right? You had this um, incredible network effect and it was all for free. It was awesome. Those days are, are gone, right? Facebook and other social sites are waking up to the fact that two things. One, um, people's feeds and their time are limited. So they want to make sure that only the best content is getting into those feeds because they want to keep them on their network. But two, like any other business, these, these platforms are trying to understand how they can better monetize um, their platforms and their traffic as well. So um, it is, in fact, a, a, a fact that organic reach has significantly declined. Um, we're actually seeing a lot of our brands, um, their organic reach has dropped by more than 20 times what they used to have before the update. But not all is lost. There are some incredible features that um, you, you have access to as a business to still take advantage of the incredible reach and engagement that are on these platforms. Um, so for instance, and I'll go through each one of these. Um, 
I had mentioned really rethinking your content calendar and how you can start to post content that's getting those highly valued um, engagements. Again, those would be comments on the post or shares. So um, a couple of examples. Um, ask the community to post pictures or share uh, their favorite recipe um, of something that might be on your menu. Post a picture that needs very little explanation and ask your audience to add their own captions. Be very careful here. If you do something like that, definitely manage the comments. People get a little, they try to be too funny and sometimes you just wanna make sure you're deleting some inappropriate comments. But um, leverage Facebook polls or create your own poll. Again, think about those ways that you can really engage your audience and get them to comment and share um, some things that your, your business is putting out there. You'll notice that when you do that, those are the posts that are gonna get a lot more reach and engagement. Um, and hopefully help you build and rebuild your content calendar to take advantage of that. Um, some other things you can do um, is to start leveraging some of the advertising features that these platforms offer. So for those of you that are new to, to social advertising, there's a great um, opportunity here um, within Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, where you can boost posts. So boosting is really just a feature that allows you to get your content seen by a broader audience um, if you think it's a great post um, and you just you pay minimal for it. So for instance, you could get it started for as low as $5 and boost some of your content um, to see what that does to your reach and, and engagement. I will tell you, just like any other post, I would only boost those posts that you're already seeing good engagement from, right? If you're not seeing people like that content or engage with it and you boost it, yeah, you're gonna see additional reach, but you're not gonna see the engagement, so I wouldn't waste the dollars on it. Um, but um, that is available to you to boost. It's, it's built for the novice, right? If you look at any of your content in social, <clears throat> you've got this boost button. You literally, it's a couple of clicks and you're, you're out and boosting. Again, really incredible if you're you know managing a single location. If you have a lot of locations, you might need to go to a technology platform to help you do this at scale. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of great platforms out there. So she is one of them that allows uh, somebody with hundreds and thousands of locations to take advantage of boosting, um, but also do it in a, a way that will get good engagement. So for instance, if you're a restaurant and you wanna boost a post, um, maybe it was a post about um, sharing your favorite recipe and one of your locations got such tremendous engagement from that and you really want to, you know, you want to share the love across all your locations, you can leverage a tool like Soshi to take that content, localize it pretty easily through dynamic text, and then push that out through all of your locations with a click of a button. If you do that natively through Facebook, you have to go in individually and do that for all of your locations. And it's just hard to scale if you're doing a lot of locations. But again, if you're a single location, very easy to take advantage of. Um, there's also additional features that um, a lot of these platforms offer. If you are not a novice uh, to, to social ads, they offer um, a lot of capabilities to really even just buy ads on, you know, based on action. If you're looking to drive traffic to the website, you're looking to get RSVPs to an event, you can buy ads that do just that. Um, so definitely take advantage of it. Um, so in summary, social has really gone from macro to micro. Um, I think a lot of the platforms are really recognizing that consumers really want local content. From Facebook to Google to local search, everything's coming back to local content and local engagement. The next level of social care is being proactive, not just reactive. As we mentioned with the growing use of uh, ratings and reviews and even Q&A. You've gotta be on top of these things. You need to be know what's, be, what's being said and you need to be part of that conversation. And then in terms of just a healthy localized social presence, you really need to be um, you know, uh, having your hands in three different areas of social content, right, that localized content that all of your consumers are hungry for, care, which means you're responding um, and actively managing your reviews and comments, and then leveraging ads for that massive reach and scale. Um, if you do those three, three things well, you're really going to see some massive improvements in your overall social, uh, social marketing efforts. Um, for those that are really interested in, in learning more about these topics, um, we just 
released um, a book on localized social marketing and how to do it well. I literally tell you guys this is a book. It's 80 pages. Um, you can download it um, at resources.meetsoshi.com uh, forward slash franchise playbook. So if you're interested, please download that. Um, and I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. We sure do. And so if you do have a question, feel free to type those in your GoToWebinar questions pane, and we will get started. We'll get through as many questions as we can. If we don't address your question before we conclude today, we'll follow up with Monica to give you some feedback via email. Our first question came from earlier in the webinar around Yelp, and given all of the review sites and rating sites, how relevant is Yelp still relevant to consumers? Yelp is actually highly relevant. And again, when we looked at um, the, the review sites that are coming up tops, um, Facebook and Google My Business have gained incredible traction over the last few years, uh, simply because that's where your consumers are spending their time, the majority of their time. So the volume of new reviews coming into those platforms, tremendous. However, Yelp, especially for restaurants, um, you know, quick serve restaurants, sit down, whatever, they are uh, they're a reputable source. A lot of consumers turn to Yelp for recommendations specifically. Um, and they're, they're, they're seen as a kind of an expert and specialist in that field. So especially for this industry, they are, they are definitely a top three that you need to be managing. Great. And along the lines of Yelp, so with Yelp, there's stickers on the window that you, you mm -hmm. see on the window. Does Google offer anything like that? They do. So Google, um, and I'm not sure who they send those out to, but I have seen them in uh, local business windows. You know, uh, review us on um, Google, uh, sorry, on Google, or even a top-rated business on Google. Um, I don't know when they send those out. Um, that's a great question. I will actually look into that, you guys, with our Google folks and get back to you on that. I don't know if they send them out to you if you reach a certain volume or rating. That's a great question, and I'll follow up on that. Great, thanks. Another question we have is with general social media feeds and ads pop-ups that you get on your phone, how do they actually access your sell to send a pop-up? So in the case of Google, um, I give Google access to my location information, and you guys probably do as well. If you've ever used Google Maps, um, if you use Google Maps, you are absolutely giving them access. Um, when you agreed to those T's and C's, those terms and conditions, that's what you gave them access to. So the experience that I had recently was you know, I'm an active uh, Google Maps user. Um, I used to live in New York and, you know, I, I use it quite often. So um, they had noticed that I was, you know, at a location and after leaving that location from Google Maps, they sent me, you know, the, the, the um, pop-up to answer the question. So I'm not, I haven't, like I had mentioned, that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. Um, but that's how they're doing it. It's when you give access to an app like Google Maps um, to track your location and those type of things. Great. Another question, and we are getting a lot of questions. So again, we'll go for about six more minutes until 12 p.m. Central Time if we can stay on the line for that duration. Um, and then we'll follow up via email. But one another question that we have is with regards to review sites and review comments coming in, can you set Q&A just so the proprietor can answer? seems like a lot of wrong information could be dispensed in sort of a general online review type of site or social media platform. Uh, that's a great question. Unfortunately, you cannot. And the reason why that is, is they, they made it a crowdsource feature for a reason. And that reason is there are a lot of consumers that have questions, again, that are commenting, and they're not getting a response from the business. And this was a lot, you know, Facebook, Google, a lot of platforms are seeing that, that these questions are going unanswered. So the response to that is to make it crowdsourced, right? So unfortunately, 
you can't just make it accessible or you know where where the the business owner is responding um, the way you can circumvent you know that misinformation getting out there as i had mentioned is actually going claiming that page and then posting those frequently asked questions that you tend to see with the response from the business owner so that lives out there already and when people go to ask a question if they see it's already there and answered they're not going to post another one nor does it give the ability for a local guide to come in and add their two cents if it's already been answered so that's what i would recommend great in reference to a boost why does a boost need to be a picture and not have many words why um hmm. So the question is, why does a boost have to be a picture and not have many words? Right. Okay, so that was probably just confusion from the image. Um, a boost is actually, it doesn't have to be an image. A boot, you can boost any content that you created um, from your social page. So if it was just a text um, you know, that you had, like share your favorite recipe, and there was no picture and that was getting great engagement and you wanted to boost that, you could absolutely boost that. I think the, the example I chose was just a, an image. Um, but even with an image, let's say you said post your favorite recipe and you had, a, you had a great picture of a pizza, but underneath you could always add content there. Um, I would recommend that you know, within social you post with pictures. Um, those type of posts receive better engagement um, if it's a good picture, it's thumb stopping, meaning, you know, you're scrolling through, we all do it on our phone, you see a cool picture, you stop, and you read it. If it's just text, I, I kind of blow past a lot of that. So, um, anyway, I, the, the answer is you don't need to just post pictures. Sorry about that. No, 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 that's great. Thank you for that clarification. Another really good question, I think, is, um, is it okay to ask customers to remove negative reviews if it was handled properly by management prior? I would not do that. Um, and again, this is my opinion and from, you know, a professional opinion would be I wouldn't ask them to remove it. Um, again, based on our research, consumers are more prone to remove it if they feel like you've handled it appropriately, right? Um, you know, nine out of 10 consumers will change their response or remove it if you've done a good job in responding to them. So take solace in that. I wouldn't ask somebody to remove it. It may blow up in your face, um, meaning I've seen folks come back and post things um, that businesses have come back and, you know, tried to say, and it, it's kind of come back around. So I, I, I would leave that up to the consumer to do it. The other thing I will, I will add is that the other thing that we've seen is that let's say that you've got a bad review out there and you guys did a tremendous job um, in terms of, you know, you saw it, you responded right away, um, you tried to take that situation offline, um, but that, that negative review still sits out there. Um, I know it's unfortunate, but just the, 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 the act of you responding to that review, most consumers said they would overlook that negative review if they thought the business appropriately handled the situation. So it's not just the person posting the review, it's those consumers that are using reviews to make the decision. If they see you responded, it kind of, it helps them kind of overlook that one and keep reading, right? So there's lots of benefits in, in, in responding to those reviews. I personally would not ask somebody to review, to remove it. I think they would do that on their own if they felt good about it. Great. Thank you for that. We have time for just one more question. And this is a question we've received in a multiple um, variety of ways in which it was asked. What do you think about paying to increase exposure and or paying to access more of the bells and whistles on review sites such as Yelp or TripAdvisor and others? So I think that you, you have to understand that a lot of these businesses, just like you're not in business to, um, you know, provide a charitable service, right? I mean, meaning it takes a lot of uh, work to build a platform that consumers trust and use and, and turn to for information. And, you know, that maintenance and management of platforms require um, funding, require, you know, dollars. And so, 
you know, when I when I see folks like Yelp, um, you know, try to monetize their service, I I think that's that they, they need to do that in order to continue their service so that they're servicing your consumers and providing service, right? So I don't think that's a bad thing. I actually, if you're seeing that your consumers turn to Yelp as a credible source um, or a number of other sites, um, and you're, you're seeing that you're getting good business from that, um, I would, I definitely look at that as a as, as advertising, um, and would definitely try to enhance my profile. Like for instance, you know, Glassdoor, we've been recruiting for some jobs. We, you know, we Glassdoor is social. Um, we paid to enhance our profile so we can add videos and all of this other content so that we're, we can sway candidates to think about Sochi over other technology platforms, right? Um, again, it's just, we're, we're in this, this day of, of digital and, um, you know, we, we, are, uh, we are all hungry for information and any chance you get to enhance that information on a platform that your consumers are already reading, clicking and consuming, I think it's worth the, the dollar spent. Great. Well, thank you so much. I gather from all of the questions that we've been receiving, we could go on and on about this topic and it's a very important one. We hope to be able to address the, the social media importance and ways in which businesses can really leverage this to, to drive that business growth in the future. And so at this point, we are out of time, but I certainly want to thank Monica for your time and expertise in presenting this webinar and to Sochi for that continued support. We will be sending out a, an email today with a link to our webinar evaluation as well as the PDF of the presentation slides. And then this week you'll receive another email with the recording to this webinar. So for those of you who may still have questions after this, please don't hesitate to email those to us at programming at winsightmedia.com. And for those people whose questions went unanswered, we will get you answers um, within the next coming days following up with Monica. So thank you again, Monica. We really appreciate your time and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.